I'm the Program Management Officer for Capacity Building and Technical Assistance at the Minamata Convention Secretariat. And I've been with the Secretariat for about a year now and have been very happily busy uh, in working on both the first round and second round of projects under this specific international program. Uh, and those are well underway. Uh, in round one, uh, we have five projects with total funding of about a million dollars that are underway now. And for round two, there are 10 projects for a total funding of about $2 million. But let me um, back up a little bit. And uh, before I turn to colleagues, I want to just give you a very brief background about the Specific International Program. As many of you know, the Specific International Program forms part of the financial mechanism of the Minamata Convention on Mercury. And that is set forth in Article 13 of the Convention. So the, the program is set up to assist developing country parties and parties with economies in transition to develop projects to support their capacity to implement their obligations under the convention. Its terms of reference were established at COP1 and finalized at COP2, and the rules of procedure of its governing board were uh, established and finalized at the third meeting of the board. Um, the, there is a great deal of information on the program on our website, which we're happy to point you to if you're having any difficulty finding that. Um, and it also uh, gives you information on who the board members are um, and all the projects uh, in the first and second round. This third round that we have opened is made possible with the generous donor contributions to our specific trust fund from Austria, Denmark, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United States. So we're really ho happy to host this um, webinar session, which we are holding in a series of sessions in different time zones and uh, in different languages to support eligible parties in developing their project proposals for this round. We look forward to hearing your questions uh, and discussing important considerations when developing and submitting your project application. So um, just some housekeeping. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. So by continuing to participate, you're providing your consent to be recorded. Um, because we don't have too many slides, we have about 20, which we will go through very carefully. Uh, we'd like to hold the questions until the end, um, at which time you'll be able to either ask them verbally um, or put your question in the chat box. And we'll give you more instructions at that time. Um, but during the course of the presentation, also, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box. Um, and we'll keep track of those, and we will do our best to be ready to answer them. So um, there are a number of my secretary colleagues participating today, and they've all been involved in getting us ready for this session, as well as um, they will be on call to help us answer all your questions uh, and take on board all your comments. Um, but in terms of presenting, uh, those duties will be shared uh, by me and my colleague Usman Tariq of the Secretariat. And I would like to, without further delay, turn it right over to him um, to start with the timeline. But let me just give you a quick overview of what we'll cover in our slides. We'll go over the timeline of the application process. We'll go over how to identify and prioritize your national issues of concern. We will talk about elaborating your project using the project application guidelines, which are posted on our website. And we'll talk about how you can finalize your project application to make sure it's really tight and convincing and, and complete. 
And then again, we'll move to questions, answers, and discussion. So with that, Usman, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mayan. Um, so with this slide, um, you, you can see that we are trying to give you an overview of the timeline uh, for the third round of application. Uh, for this particular round, uh, as you can see, it was launched on the 15th of December, and uh, now we have a deadline of 18th of March 2021, where uh, we will receive the final applications from you. Um, we, for this round of application, we are introducing an initial feedback phase or a technical appraisal, uh, whereby we provide comments intended to help clarify or correct items in the application to ensure a technically sound application package for full appraisal. Um, such revisions could include, for example, edits to the logical framework or, or the project budget. Um, as you can see, you will have a very tight window to provide any updates before the project is fully appraised. So that's why it would be good to have your uh, input on, on, uh, on that. Um, so uh, that please note that this step is to ensure that the applications that go to the GB are uh, for, for the governing board are as as good as possible. Um, and that if, if the proposal is approved by the governing board for funding, it would require very little, if any, revisions at that stage. However, this is not to say that the initial submission should be a sort of a rough draft. Um, the secretary, of course, will not be able to rewrite the applications for you, and the amount of time that you will have for the revisions will be very limited. So what we are trying to say is that your first application needs to be closely uh, follow the, uh, the application guidelines and it should be in a near perfect uh, condition. Um, the, the last step shown here is, is, uh, is, is a notification, if you see this slide. So the last step here is the notification, um, but for the successful applicants, that is when the intensive work for implementation begins including addressing any comments of the governing board and making any needed changes to a project document. Um, and then we can work out the details for the legal agreement, including project focal points and, and, and banking details, etc. But all of that is, is beyond the scope of this particular webinar. So we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. So, we just want to share some some of the important things uh, here, uh, which we which we which are the fundamentals of the specific international program. So the first question that is is commonly asked is how much funding is available. So uh, the answer to that is that the the the, SIP, uh, the specific international program may provide support from fifty thousand dollars to up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars per project proposal. Um, this amount is inclusive of fees for monitoring, valuation, and financial audits, and we will talk about that uh, later in, in the presentation. Um, then a second important question is who can apply? So for this, we uh, for now, only eligible governments can apply to, to the specific international program. Uh, to be eligible, a government must be a party to the convention and must be from a developing country or country with economy in transition. Um, some of you may be in the process of becoming a party. Uh, for your application to be accepted, you must have uh, transmitted ratification documents to the UN Treaty Office by the time the application period ends, which is March 18th. Um, the specific international program takes full account of the specific needs and special circumstances of the parties that are small island uh, developing states and least developed countries. Um, governments uh, refer to the national government ministry or department in charge of implementing the obligations of that country under the Minamata Convention. Affiliations of governments and local governments are not eligible, unfortunately. Um, but several governments can jointly submit a sub-regional, regional, or inter-regional project. In this case, one government is, is specified as a project lead this may be a good approach for implementation issues, which are best addressed in sub-regional or inter-regional coordinated, coordinated manner. Um, the, the amount of funding it remains the same, so you can only apply up to $250,000, even if it is a regional project. Um, then we come to the duration of the project. 
Um, projects must be completed within 36 months, uh, and that is three years. Um, and the technical activities must be completed within at most 33 months so that reporting, auditing, and evaluation can be completed within a maximum time frame of 36 months. Um, then uh, there is a criteria of project appraisal, and they are appraised uh, on a set criteria which is elaborated by our governing board. Um, first there is the eligibility criteria, which I discussed a bit earlier. And in addition to, to the government being a developing country party or party with economy, a party with economy in transition, uh, the project must not duplicate efforts already funded by the Global Environment Facility or the special program. Um, in addition to the eligibility criteria, we also have criteria for coherence appraisal and prioritization appraisal. Um, we will be touching on some of these issues during the presentation, um, and, and details of the criteria are elaborated in the application guidelines. Um, so again, we would ask you to look at the application guidelines very carefully. Now moving on to the next slide. Um, so since you have joined us for this webinar, we, you are already very familiar with the Minamata Convention. So we will not be discussing its provision today. Um, but we want to illustrate here that your application must reflect the ways in which you will improve your ability to implement one or more of these obligations. Um, that will be your starting point for designing your proposal. Um, you first want to think about the particular changes you seek to make and the problem that you seek to address through your proposal. Uh, by now, most of the countries will have the results from the Minamata initial assessments. Um, this, together with other similar projects funded earlier or being funded currently, uh, will provide you with a, with a good idea of the national issues which require your attention and project intervention. Um, it is important to keep in mind the scope of the specific international program while developing the project proposal. We will talk about this a bit later in the presentation also. Um, so, once um, you, you have a clear idea about which topic your specific international program project will focus on, uh, we recommend using the theory of change for conceptualizing um, and future planning of your project and developing and addressing national issues of concern. Theory of change is, uh, is, is not required. Uh, as part of the project application, but it is really useful way to bring your team, your cross-ministry group, or your multi-stakeholder multi group together to begin designing the project together. Um, I would like to explain this concept by the, the, the concept of theory of change uh, in, a, in a bit more detail. Um, in essence, the, the theory of change in its most simple form um, um, th this is the this is a very simple form of the theory of change, uh, but uh, but other theory of change could be m more complex, looking at assumptions and drivers and other related factors. But the simple format is also very useful for for our purpose. So we will concentrate on this one. Um, we start with the impact statement, uh, which is defined as the long term change to the environment and to human living conditions. Um, it will not be achieved in full duration during the project's implementation period. Um, in this particular case, impact statement is project uh, is that human health and environment from anthropogenic emissions and diseases of mercury and mercury compounds. So they are protected. Yeah? Um, so once you have established the impact statement, you have to focus on developing a project outcome. Now. The project outcome is the observed changes of behavior, knowledge, or skill, or can also be a change in attitude, action, or condition. Examples of outcomes include improved knowledge and technical capacity, improved coordination, um, communication uh, between stakeholders, or, or, or increased awareness. For this example, we, we have stated the outcome as increased national capacity for developing control strategies 
for existing and new sources of emissions. Um, as you can observe, the outcome of this project is closely related to fulfilling one of the obligations of the Convention and establishes a clear link between the two. So after establishing the, the outcome, you need to think about the outputs. Now, outputs are tangible goods or services the project produces or delivers. Um, in, in this example, we have the inventory of relevant sources in, in Annex D as one of the outputs and a national plan developed for emission control as the second output. Again, as you can see, both outputs contribute directly to reaching the outcome of the project. And then the last component of the theory of change uh, are the activities. Um, basically, these are the building blocks of the project. Um, you must think about detailed activities which are required for, to achieve the output. Um, they can be establishing sectoral guidances for data collection. It could be conducting um, meetings to engage the relevant stakeholders, conducting trainings, and things like that. Um, but so this is how a theory of change in its simplest form looks like. Um, to, to further elaborate on some of other considerations when developing a project proposal, um, I will invite Marianne to, to continue, please. Thanks very much, Usman. So some other things that um, we take into consideration both in the project proposal and in the, um, in the implementation of your project uh, we're going to discuss in the next couple of slides. One very important element is to address the gender aspects of your project. So applications submitted under the specific international program need to explain how the design and the implementation and the monitoring and evaluation of the project will include a gender lens. So projects will be much more successful and their results will be more sustainable if they explicitly address gender. So not only should the projects consider how the mercury risks and management approaches might impact men and women differently, but they should also integrate principles of equal participation and non-discrimination uh, in the project activities including the staffing and the management of projects, in stakeholder engagement, and in public participation. The project should ensure that uh, it raises awareness among both men and women and ensure opportunities to include perspectives of both men and women, such as in training opportunities. And the project should be able to demonstrate that it's doing this and has done it when it is reviewed. Uh, so it'll be useful to include gender indicators and targets uh, as you elaborate your project, particularly in its logical framework. And those, those indicators and targets could relate to activities such as generating sex disaggregated data that reflects the impacts of mercury pollution. Um, and here I'd like to note that project, projects that are aimed specifically at evaluating impacts of an exposure to mercury should include plans to evaluate the gender differentiated nature and impacts of impacts and exposures. It could also include activities such as planning and organizing awareness raising activities that educate relevant stakeholders, such as the general public, on the gender differentiated and socially determined impacts of mercury management. So those kind of activities could include producing information materials, uh, media releases that contain gender specific information, um, and also ensuring that in-person activities are held at times that women as well as men are able to attend. Another type of activity would be promoting multi-stakeholder approaches to ensure effective participation of different groups, including women, in policy development and decision making. Also creating terms of reference for project staff that ensure equal opportunity for women and men and uh, where appropriate require skills and expertise in gender. And then monitoring the benefits and participation and feedback among women and men during the project activities and incorporate, incorporate remedial action 
that promotes gender equality as appropriate. So we have a lot more, well, not a lot more, but we have considerable more information in our um, application guidelines on this topic that will really help you think this, this part through further. And there is a space in your application for this, but it should also be integrated throughout. And in the next slide, um, I would like to talk about environmental and social safeguards. So in addition to screening for gender aspects of your project, the Secretariat will review applications and flag any potential adverse impacts from a safeguards perspective. And to explain this further, I want to note that uh, in February 2020, um, UNEP adopted its revised um, environmental and social sustainability framework. And that framework, the ESSF, follows um, the following guiding principles. Those are leave no one behind, human rights and gender equality and women's empowerment, sustainability and resilience, and accountability. So the ESSF standards uh, address the topics listed here on your screen, um, such as cultural heritage, indigenous peoples, I won't read the whole list. Um, but uh, so we will be taking a look at all these aspects in your application um, and then uh, monitoring and corrective action would be implemented during the life of the project to address any such impacts that might arise. And for those projects that have a particularly useful approach uh, from a safeguards perspective, we would also seek to publicize that because um, that can benefit other, um, other parties that are implementing their projects. So um, finally on this uh, topic, I want to also note that it's, it's really important um, to have a robust stakeholder engagement because that is an essential part of implementing safeguards. Okay, now moving on to the financial mechanism. Um, as we noted in, in the introduction to the webinar, the financial mechanism is established in Article 13 of the Minamata Convention. It includes two parts, the Global Environment Facility and this program, the Specific International Program. And we also consider the special program on institutional strengthening to be an important mechanism that supports our parties um, and also those seeking to become parties to the Minamata Convention. So with all these, uh, these mechanisms and, and programs uh, available to us, how will you know which program to seek funding from? On well, the next slide, um, I want to explain that a little bit further. So how, how can you know which program is right for the work you're trying to do? Well, that, of course, depends on what you're trying to accomplish in your project. So while all of these mechanisms can work to build institutional frameworks, policies, laws, regulations, and management systems, um, there's significant differences between them. So I want to talk about that a little bit. So, for the specific international program, the focus is squarely on implementation, um, and it's to implement obligations that are laid out in our convention. There's some other um, qualities of the program that are different from some of these other mechanisms. One is that an applicant contribution is not required, um, and that it's, again, it's specific to our convention, so hence its name, Specific International Program. Uh, it doesn't touch on um, other aspects of, of chemical management or, or other related chemical and waste conventions. Uh, it's also direct to the party government. There are no implementing agencies. Um, that said, there would be partners involved in your projects, and we'll talk about partners uh, a bit more later. Um, now, the Global Environment Facility has a, a slightly different focus. Of course, um, it is a hugely important part of the Convention's financial mechanism. Its focus is on achieving global environmental benefits. So it provides funding 
to projects that will achieve global environmental benefits. Um, also, it requires co-finance uh, and can really leverage a, a larger uh, movement of capital towards addressing your problem. Um, it can be convention specific or it can be multifocal. We see in the Jeff projects that, that some of them um, simultaneously address mercury and pops, for example, or waste management across the conventions. Um, there are also instances of multifocal approaches um, where a project that is, let's say, addressing biodiversity could have a mercury component funded by the mercury um, programming element of the GEF. Um, and of course, as many of you probably know, the work done um, in a GEF project is done through an implementing agency. So that would be agencies like UNEP, uh, like Conservation International, like um, the uh, UNDP and UNIDO and others. And then the special program, its focus is on institutional strengthening. So, so really focusing on the, the governmental um, approach, but it's across the chemicals and waste multilateral environmental agreements as well as SICA. So it promotes mainstreaming of approaches to those to implementing those conventions and instruments. It does require an applicant contribution, um, and it must strengthen across more than one of these um, multilateral environmental agreements in SICA. So it wouldn't just be mercury specific. And it's, it also is direct without the use of implementing agencies. So um, I know that this is kind of a lot of information, and it probably isn't crystal clear, this, this question of um, what is a, a specific international program and what is not uh, is, is always a bit of a complicated issue, um, but I think it'll become more clear as we discuss uh, further our, um, our application guidelines and what we expect of you in the project application. Um, but just to, to illustrate a little bit further, so a specific international program project could, for example, lay the groundwork for a larger GEF project. Um, it could also address a different aspect of a larger issue. And for this, I'd love to give uh, an example of one of our round two projects, which is um, supporting work on ASGM, but from a very different angle than other ASGM projects, including um, those funded by the Jeff through, for example, Planet Gold Take. So, so this project um, is actually supporting uh, healthcare workers in getting out into the field, and uh, it's, it would be training the healthcare workers and allowing them to train the communities impacted by ASGM. Um, to better uh, manage their risks from mercury use in ASGM. So, so it's not duplicative of anything funded by the Jeff. It takes a different angle, but it builds on work that has already been done or is being done through the Jeff. Um, it, another way to, to do it is that a specific international program project could could take an approach that was used in a Jeff project, but apply it to a different sector. So again, it would be building on a significant body of work that has already been undertaken or is, is being undertaken, but you're applying it um, with a very um, much tighter focus um, to address the problem statement that you've come up with. So I hope that helps a little bit. And with that, I would like to turn back to Usman to really um, let us dig deeply into the project application and forms. Thank you, Megan. Um, so as Megan mentioned, I would like to, you know, go a bit deeper and show you the how the project application form looks like and, you know, developing the log frame and the work plan 
etc. So let me just see if I can share the form. Um, are you able to see my screen? My so yes. this is this is how the the application form looks like. Um, the the first part, as you can see, is the applicant government and applicant government institution. The names and details. This this section is is very important because this is our basis for communication, and you know we, we need to have these the right names of the name of the person who is the right focal point for the project. Um, then another area is uh, which we consider. I mean, all of this is very important, but I'm just trying to focus out things which require a bit more explanation. Um, so the area on project summary is is important since it provides a high level summary of the project, and it will be used for communication purposes. It will go on our website and other communication materials. So therefore, it needs to be really thought through. Um, then another area which is important, as Marian mentioned before, is on the project partners. Um, it is uh, important to highlight the key project partners in, in this section. Um, uh, and it is also important to note that the project is implemented by the applicant, and there is no provision for an implementation agency. But some of our applicants actually plan to work closely with the, with the Badal Convention Regional Center or a non-government institution for a research institution or even, even a local office of one of the UN agencies. Um, so these um, would be listed in, in project partners over here. Uh, the responsibility for implementing the project always remains with the applicant government entity. Um, another area that uh, we would like to talk about is on, on monitoring, reporting, and uh, evaluation and audit section. Um, it, is, it is very important to understand the, the different functions of monitoring, reporting, evaluation, and audit, and identify the relevant personnel to conduct these activities. Um, so we'll, I'll try to go through each definition so that it is clear what is expected in each of them. So monitoring and reporting of a project uh, refers to routine collection of uh, collection and analysis of information to track progress, check compliance, and make informed decisions for project management at the level uh, at each level of the logical framework. We'll go into that later. Um, so monitoring activities uh, need to be built into the project work plan and allocated human resources from the start. Uh, regular monitoring is the responsibility of the project manager and forms the, the basis for periodic reporting. The reporting template will be provided by the secretariat and will be part of the legal agreement signed by both parties. Of course, this comes at a later stage when the, the project is approved by the governing board. Um, so evaluation uh, is so for projects with funding for from the specific international project uh, program, uh, with funding of less than $150,000, the re recipient government is required to arrange for a terminal review. The terminal review is mandatory and falls under the responsibility of that government or the applicant and can be done internally or externally. Um, for all projects with funding from specific international program of, of over $150,000, a terminal evaluation is mandatory. So these a terminal evaluation will be initiated based on criteria identified by UNEP's evaluation office. And the sex date of the Minamata Convention will manage the process of terminal evaluation. Uh, funding for this expense will be retained by the Secretariat from the amount as per appro approved uh, project budget. So as an example, let's say your project is seeking $220,000 of funding, if approved, your budget will be $210,000 because the Secretariat will keep $10,000 for the evaluation. But on the other hand, it will not, you as an applicant will not have to allocate any funding to the terminal evaluation. So that's the benefit of that. Um, and the, uh, and the last term that is important here is, uh, is audit. So the applicant government is responsible for the financial management of the uh, of the whole project and and also the audit of the project. 
So records have to be kept for 10 years uh, following the closure of the project. And it is very important to note that funds should be set aside in the, even in the beginning of the project for a uh, financial audit by an independent third party. So these these are like a few things, and again, uh, they they are very well explained in the project application guidelines. And of course, we are happy to explain them further if need be. Um, then we come to um, I'll I'll switch back to the slides. Please give me a second. So I hope you can see my slide. Um, so then I would like to now go into a bit more detail on, on developing your project uh, log frame, project work plan, and the budget. Um, so for me, uh, personally, log frame is one of the most important things uh, of, of a project. Um, basically, it describes the, the project components and explains the details of how project will operate and will affect the change intended. Um, it will serve as a roadmap for implementation and as a tool for evaluating and monitoring progress. Um, in this slide, uh, you can see what a log frame looks like or the key components of the log frame. Uh, once the impact and the outcome of the project is determined, you need to elaborate on the various outputs and associated activities. So there are some key terms which require a good understanding in order to develop the log frame. As mentioned earlier, um, outputs are tangible goods or services the project produces or delivers. In this example, the output is the development of a national mercury information system. But how do we know if we are making progress in achieving that output? This is where the indicators and means of verifications come. So <clears throat> in indicators is, is a unit of measure measurement that helps assess progress towards achieving achievement of the output. Um, it is uh, vital to know the baseline of the indicator that what what was the situation when we started. So this is the baseline, and w w where do we want to be, which is which is the target. Um, so um, we we need to know this before we 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 start our project, like baseline and where where do we start from and where do we want to end up in. Um, and then um, a little bit, I would like to talk a little bit on the activities now. Um, activities, as mentioned earlier, are basically the practical actions like conducting workshop, performing a steering committee, or preparing an analytical report. Um, and so as, and these activities, of course, should be very much connected to the outputs indicators so that everything falls into uh, logically uh, in place. Um, and then lastly, the, uh, this is the term called a milestone. So basically, when you when you want, this is the time when you want uh, uh, the activity to be completed. For example, technical working group with relevant stakeholders should be formed within six months of of year one. So moving on. So this is uh, the, the the how a work plan looks like. So once you have developed the log frame it needs to be reflected in the work plan. So all of the outputs and activities are repeated here in the work plan, showing the time frame in, in which the work will be done. This is done by quarters, so and you, and you do not need to specify the actual month. Uh, in fact, it is better to, to just count months from the beginning of the project because you will not know the start date because it depends on the, the signature of when the person's uh, both focal points signed. Uh, the legal agreement. Um, if a project is approved by the governing board, we begin the process of revising the project documents and, if necessary, negotiating legal agreements for the transfer of funds. So this take can take some time. So we we do recommend having the months anonymous in in project documents. So moving on from work plan to the project budget. Um, well, I, I, I hope this slide is a bit clear because I have put some transitions which do not show here. But uh, um, well, let's 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 then talk about the budget um, in in a, in in a similar way that we have done before. Each activity in the work plan has to be reflected in the budget. 
um, you, as you can see, all this is the work plan, and all these activities need to be uh, in, in reflected here in, in in the budget. And all of the budget, all of the activities need to have budget allocation. So one important thing to keep in mind is that section 2.5 of the form A, where you have the budget summary, it also needs to reflect exactly if you had put uh, $20,000 and output forth, this should be reflected here in, in the project budget. Um, we will provide you with the, with an overview of different budget uh, categories, uh, which you can consider when developing the budget. And I would like to just show you a bit more close-up of how a project budget can look like, um, just to give you a better idea how, how it is. <clears throat> so understanding the budget now. So as I mentioned, um, when, when developing the budget, it is important to understand what kind of activities can be funded by this in the specific trust fund. Um, budget categories are divided into four broad categories, namely uh, staff and personnel cost, contractual services, equipment, um, uh, and travel. Uh, please note that for specialized and technical equipment, 10% uh, is set as a cap, although up to 25% could be considered by the governing board in exceptional circumstances with very good justification um, uh, which has to be provided. Um, the output of, of on monitoring, review, evaluation, and audit should not exceed $15,000, including any amount retained by the secretariat. So please also just a note on that, that please make sure that this is uh, this output is in your log framework plan and budget. Um, so one, one category of the budget which sometimes causes confusion is the one on, on travel. Um, um, although it is called travel, you can allocate all costs associated with organizing a meeting, including paying per diem to participants in this budget category. So maybe looking at this one, it's, uh, if you have any further questions, we are more than happy to, to assist you. But this is this, um, yeah, this, this category, I think you need to maybe this, uh, focus it a bit more and see it as a broader, it's not only just travel, it's, it covers a bit broader thing. Um, now that we understand what uh, can be funded, it is equally important to understand what cannot be funded by the uh, trust fund. So as you can see from the slide, um, recurrent or um, institutional costs, including the rental of offices, wages of civil servants, hospitality costs, for example, costs in connection with the reception given to participants in workshops, conference and seminars, office equipment, all these things, they, 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 we expect the, the, the applicant to cover these expenses. So moving on, um, I would like to just now show you another, well, first let me show you how the budget looks like. Just to give you an idea, so this is how the budget, um, uh, the Form B budget looks like. It has four distinct um, tables. First one is gives you uh, a budget summary, and the second one, as the table four, this is the most important one. This is the elaborated one, which gives out you, you have output one, two, three, and four, and how many you have, and you have um, activities, and then you fill out these and. The good thing about this is that the, the moment you fill out these, uh, they are already automatically reflected in, in um, by the summary. Um, then uh, this table five allows you as, as a applicant uh, to provide if you have uh, uh, some some funding for particular activities, you can elaborate them in this uh, in this table. And then um, this is a class explanation. So just uh, uh, repeating what we I, I just discussed uh, in my slide before. Um, so now we can move on to one of the uh, last forms, which is form C. Let me try to share it with you. Just give me a second, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
Um, sorry about that. I, I for some reason I cannot open one of the forms. But anyway, that that's uh, that's the form C, which is the the letter of uh, transmittal. Um, and uh, um, the, the, this document uh, needs to be signed by three very important entities. First is the applicant government official. Uh, this should be the same person whose contact you provided in section one of form A. The second signature required are from the Minamata Convention focal point. And the third signature are from the Jeff operational focal point. Um, you are requested to email the signed form in PDF format to the Secretariat for the application to be considered complete. Um, you are requested not to modify the forms format as modified forms will not be accepted. Um, it, is, it is worth noting that for the purpose of the application, we require the signature of the application government official. But once the project has been approved, we will request you to provide with the name of the government focal point or the, or the person who would be doing the day-to-day -day management of the project and lead the, the, the project. But that again, it this comes at the, at the later stage when the application is, is, is approved and we are trying to develop the legal agreement. Um, then uh, we have uh, the, the, the last slide, which is on finalizing the project application. So once you have completed forms A, B, and C, we recommend that you uh, double check and make sure that you have provided all the information as highlighted in the completeness check in section 2.1 of form A. Uh, please make sure the contact details are correct since they, they will be our official means of communication. Um, the information on related, related project uh, is important since it shows how project has potentially built on other projects or uh, if it is being executed in a synergetic way with the ongoing project. Um, just to note that uh, the requested, um, the, the form A should be in PDF and Word. It's very important so that we can you know, copy and uh, utilize information there easily. Uh, form B should be in, in Excel and form C should could be in PDF and in Word, that's up to you. Uh, one important to, thing to note is that please do not mail us uh, via post uh, because that, that won't be reaching us in time and might delay the, <coughs> delay the process. Um, with that, um, yeah, so, so last thing, is uh, once uh, the secretary receives the application form, uh, we will send you an uh, email acknowledging receipt. If for some reason you do not receive a response from us within a week of, of sending, please contact us uh, at our official um, email address and we will definitely try to take care of that. Uh, with that, I think that's, that's it. Um, or, uh, if you have, uh, I mean, the floor is open for question, answers, and discussion. So, Marianne? Over yeah, time. thank you, Usman. And um, hopefully, we didn't go too slow or too quickly for all of you, and that this was helpful. But we are very happy to answer questions either now or, or in the future as you develop your applications. But I also want to note. Um, that hopefully many of you are already familiar with the Global Mercury Partnership, um, which is sort of a, a, a sibling organization to us. The Global Mercury Partnership is a voluntary network um, that has been around since 2005, and uh, it works with the, basically the same objective as the Minamata Convention, which is to protect human health and the environment from mercury. And it's a, it's a multi-stakeholder uh, group of, of governments, intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, um, industry, academia, but basically it's a lot of expertise. So if you go to the partnership website, you might find a lot of very useful information um, that will help you think through your, your problem statements or, or your approaches to the problem. Um, and uh, the partnership is also very happy to um, answer questions that you might have. So their secretariat is, is located here with us in Geneva, um, and we're happy to point you further towards them. Um, and there's a lot of expertise that has grown throughout the world on, on this topic of, of mercury and the, 
the risks that it poses. So um, we we encourage you to reach out to, to your networks and other networks um, to help you develop a good proposal. Um, so right now, um, I would like to, I'm going to take a look at the chat, but also if you want to um, ask a question verbally or make a comment verbally, um, you can raise your hand. Um, and I, I see already that we have at least one hand raised. I'm sorry, I can't see your full name, but it is uh, Luma. Um, and uh, if you could, if Sharifal, if you could unmute um, Luma and we can get the Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for the very, very informative uh, pr presentation. I have just one small question. I'm from the Kingdom of Bahrain. And I would like to understand uh, the chances uh, to uh, provide fund for a small island development state, developing state. Um, certainly, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, we do give special, uh, the, the, the specific international program um, is for developing countries and con countries with economies in transition giving um, special attention to least developed countries and small island developing states. Now, our, our governing board has not um, defined any further the eligibility, so the, the application would have to speak for itself as to how, it's, how it is uh, addressing the problem and how it will be convincing to the board. So I hope that helps answer your question. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. And um, so, Kuntia? Uh, Marianne, thank you for the uh, presentation. I have one uh, small question to ask. I'd, uh, given that uh, the applic uh, eligible applicant for this uh, project should be the member of, of the convention, isn't it? But with Cambodia right now, we. I just want to ask you because uh, recently, the the parliament just adopted the ratification documents and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs sends the uh, assistance instrument to the secretary on the 6th of January, which we like last week. So I want to ask, is Cambodia still eligible to be applicant for this project? Or program? Yeah. And I'm sorry, can you repeat what, what um, country you I'm just like, given, given the, the, uh, this program is only for the party to convention. R yes, but right. for Cambodia, we just recently sent yes. the uh, instrument, like, uh, you know, assessment instrument on the 5th of January. So if we look at the convention, it said after a uh, three month after the country, meet the, the assistance instrument and then they become the party. So in that case, but if I'm not wrong, to count that, maybe Cambodia will become the party on the like the fifth of April. So I'm asking is still eligible for Cambodia to you know to apply for this program. Yes. Sorry for my delay in responding, but uh the procedure that we have uh, taken on board uh, is that if your um, instrument of ratification or acceptance is received by the UN Treaty Office, by the time that our application window closes, which is mid-March, then you would be eligible. So we would encourage uh, countries in that situation to prepare their applications and submit them in the hopes that that, that timing works out. Um, so it, it sounds like in, in your case it would be kind of it would be close. Um, so we'd be happy to discuss that further. But we would still really encourage you to keep us uh, informed of the progress that that um, instrument of ratification is making. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. 
Okay. We did also uh, receive a, a question from Zygon in Pakistan, and, and we, we are very aware that Pakistan is one of our newer parties. We're very happy about that. Um, and so his question is whether there's uh, dedicated funds for ASGM um, for the development of national action plans. That's an excellent question, and it's a good illustration of the difference between the specific international program and the global environment facility, because the JUF does fund enabling activities under the convention and two very specific types of enabling activities that are funded by the JUF are Minamata initial assessments and ASGM national action plans for those countries who have informed the Secretariat that ASGM using mercury in their territory is more than insignificant. So an, an ASGM NAP project would require both that notification to the Secretariat and a proposal to the, to the Jeff. Okay, maybe my colleagues might be able to help me to see if there are more hands raised or more questions. I don't see any so far. Anyone else see any that I'm missing? Um, well, again, our, our application guidelines, which are posted on our webpage, if you navigate to the specific international program uh, under the implementation tab, uh, you'll see the, um, the information on this round, including each of the forms and um, the application guidelines. So we really encourage you to, um, not only can you refer back to this presentation, which we will post on our website, um, but you'll be able to refer to the, the application guidelines, which contain all the information we've given you today, but in even more detail. So those should be very helpful to you as you develop your applications. Um, I want to I want to stress again the importance that Usman referred to of your log frame. Your logical framework is is really an essential part of the the application. But almost even more important, it's an essential part. If you get if your application gets approved by our governing board, um, the log frame will form kind of the heart of your project document and your your legal agreement with the secretariat. Um, and and to the extent that those are well developed, well formulated at this stage then we will be able to very quickly move towards um, for those projects that are approved for funding by the governing board. We would be able to do any needed revisions rather quickly based on a good, good log frame. And we would be able to, to move that right into our legal agreement and get the project underway. Um, so, so we really encourage you to, to work hard on your log frame, but also that, that all the elements in your log frame, the, the outcomes, the outputs, and the activities have to be reflected again in your work plan and reflected again in exactly the same way in your budget. So it's your activity-based budget, it's line by line, and those lines are going to match up exactly with your log frame. So. Uh, Please, please study up on that, and um, we wish you very much um, good collaboration with your colleagues and good um, success in getting your, your applications done. I'm going to um, turn by e I'm going to turn back to any of my colleagues who can let me know if I've missed any questions. And yes, you're you're most welcome to contact us directly by email, um, and we're happy to answer questions that way too. We'll just give give folks a couple of more minutes. 
in case there are any lingering questions or anything you'd like us to repeat. So, Kuntia, did you have an additional question? Okay, maybe not. Great. Okay. Well, uh, with that, I would like to thank my colleagues for all the hard work to get this uh, this webinar training session done and uh, presented. And uh, feel free to join any of our other sessions, one of which is in French, one of which is in Spanish. Um, and uh, we look forward to your, your further questions um, and to your applications. And with that, I wish you a, a good evening or a good rest of your day, wherever you may be. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>